Good evening, everybody. It's good to have you back. Almost celebration time. Jesus will be um, a few years old, <laughs> uh, according to historical data. Uh, of course, most of us are aware that in all probability his, his uh, birthday was not in December. But I think there's a really good reason that we don't know the specific date of his birth. Or maybe we would worship the day more than we do the Savior. So let's don't do that uh, in whatever we choose to do. Let's make sure that he's the center of it all because it is about him. I'm always, I love this kind of year. Here's why. People that are out shopping to buy people's presents that don't even believe in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? But they, they celebrate his birth because it's a, it's a day of festivities. So, and it's the same way many times with Easter. I know Easter's a pagan holiday and all that stuff behind it. But also, not to us, it's a resurrection day, the first day of the week. So anyway, uh, it's good to have you here. And I'm praying that everybody here has a, has a great um, Christmas and time with your family, time with your friends, both of them. That's usually about our limit today as <laughs> a couple of friends. But anyway, we're just tonight's not going to be a long service. It's going to be a short service, but I hope a meaningful service. You're going to take your Bibles. Go with me to Luke chapter 2. You're very familiar with this. Many of us will be reading this in our homes this year. Uh, it's the story of, supposedly we call it the story of the birth of Christ. And you'll find it, of course, in Matthew also. Um, of course, as you well know, Matthew gives the lineage uh, according to Joseph and Luke gives the lineage according to Mary. He had to, he had to actually qualify to be considered a king. He had to have he had to have the the lineage of Abraham and the lineage of David to be qualified as a king. And so both of those. That's why both of those are in the scriptures. You'll you'll find that. But let's begin to read and just read down slowly through this and and enjoy the. And I'm sure how many of you have have had have either read the story at home many times. Or either had it read to you many times. And I'm sure you have. Um, I don't know how many times I have preached the Christmas story from almost every aspect I can think of. And many preachers have that have been preaching very long. I've tried to preach it from different views. Joseph's view, Mary's view, um, you know, all of those. And, and uh, I, tonight I have one different view I want to share with you when we get to it. And I'll, I'll show you what that is. But let's go in chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. Now that's why they had gone uh, to their own city, each one. That's why this Christ was born in Bethlehem. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That's one of the connections that was necessary for him to be called the king, David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes we think about it. We look at, you know, little clean, uh, wonderful illustrations of the manger, in a sense. And yet we all know that we're talking about a livery stable, a place where animals were. And I don't know, but if you grew up on the farm like I did, I didn't really care to even go into them quote, manger, much less be born there, because it was a very unsanitary place. And uh, boy, that would, today, would you know, people would say, oh, that child will never live being born in something like that. Well, they forgot this child couldn't die, no matter where he'd been born. But he was born in that unusual atmosphere. In verse 8, and there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. That's one reason that most people don't believe it was in December because even in Jerusalem and that area in Israel, it would have been very, very cold. It would have been totally unusual for the shepherds to be in the field with their flocks this time of the year. 
And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And I like this next thought, and they were sore afraid. Well, I guess. Let me read that again. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The messenger of the Lord literally descended on them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. What a magnificent picture that must have been. And Luke is doing the best to draw out the illusion so we can get a picture of the miraculous event that's being announced. I've often wondered, most of us have had, when we, our children were born, we put it in the Tallahassee Democrat or whatever, but hey, the Angel Gazette was sounding out his birth notice. Don't you like that? And so it says, and, verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Deliverer. Can you imagine how the Jews must have felt when they heard this, those that heard this message then, and should be now, but nevertheless, which is Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. All because of the birth of a baby. All because what Isaiah said, a sign. I'm going to give you a, a sign. A virgin shall conceive. And this is the declaration that God was following up on the promise made over 730 years ago. So he's telling them then, and all the angelic hosts are giving him praise before he's born. And it came to pass as the angels were going away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go, yes, us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They recognized where the message came from. Not the angels, but for the Lord over the angels. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary. Can you imagine Mary in this scenario? We don't want to elaborate too much on this, but here's, here's a woman who had never known men. That's what the word virgin means, and uh, where Isaiah is speaking, he's talking about a young woman who's never known a man. Here she is, she's, she's delivering a child that it was of God. And somebody said, well, you know, every birth is of God, not like this one. This was a verse that stood out above, I mean, a birth, and Mary kept all the things that were being said. She kept those things and pondered them, considered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told them they had laid eyes some of the first to lay eyes on God in the flesh. No wonder they were so excited. In verse 21, And when the eight days were accomplished by the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. Guess who got the name? Joseph. I used to feel sorry for Joseph. Here he is, had to you know, spend all this time with a woman he was espoused to, and yet was was not was was not able to touch her in any kind of sensual fashion at all because the babe, the child was born before he knew her, and knowing this, and when I saw that God let him name Jesus, I've never felt sorry for him anymore. Would you? And he said he called his name Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. It never gets old, does it? I've never read it when I didn't see something I'd never seen before, like most of the other Bible. But I want you to go to Philippians chapter, chapter 2, and we're just going to read a couple of verses out of here, and then uh, we're going to let you go home early tonight, the Lord willing. But I felt it was so important 
for us to get together. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 5. This is called the kenosis, uh, the self-emptying of Jesus. But I don't think I've ever addressed it from this particular point of view because this, to me, this is Jesus' point of view. This is what He's saying to, through the Word of God to us so that we can comprehend more of the story I just read. To me, it's a clarification of the story that's already been, been told that I just read. Paul addresses this and he's talking about this the exhortation to be like Christ. And he uses verse 5 in an, as an example when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now what that means is let the mind that you have adapt the thinking of Christ in the sense of living like He lived. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Look at the next verse. Who being in the form of of God. This is the nature, the morphe of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Can you imagine that? He chose not to have a reputation when he came into the world. Certainly when he left it, he died because of a reputation. But then he said he made himself of no reputation and took upon him him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of what? Men. There's the virgin birth. He was made in the likeness of men. You see, Jesus from His very birth saw in the distance the next part. And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death. Death, even the death of the cross. As we said, the cradle to Jesus was the beginning of that which could only end at the cross. He saw it in his own spirit. Of course, being God, he knows all things. But he came and he knew that when he humbled himself and became God's son, that the end results as far as his physical body would die one day on a place called Calvary. But the physical part of Christ, body of Christ, that must die was not God, the God part. The God part resumed another form, but continued on. Look at the next couple of verses. Wherefore, for this reason, because from the cradle to the cross, He did what He was asking us to do. Let's think like Jesus thinks. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who from the very beginning, from the beginning of our salvation to the end of our physical life, it should be in submission to the will of the Father. And that's what His was. Because He said this, wherefore God, because of what He did, God also highly exalted Him. Exaltation from God will never take place until humility takes place in a human being. And that's what He was doing. Jesus humbled Himself. And he said, God highly exalted him and given him a name which is above, how many? Every name. So when you say the name Jesus, the whole world should bow. Not do as young man, we just, my wife was looking at, she was watching something on, I don't know, YouTube or whatever it was, coming to, coming to church a while ago, and this preacher was standing on the sidewalk reading the Word of God. And people started complaining and the police came and arrested him for reading the Bible. Instead of arresting him, they should have been on their knees before him. Not honoring him, but the name he represented. And I promise you, every person that has that kind of attitude toward God will stand before the real God one day. So we made this plain. God exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And here's why. That at the name, just the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven, even the angels and the saints already there should bow at that name of things in heaven and things in earth. And just in case that doesn't cover everybody, the things under the earth, even the earthworms you've got to bow down. Why? He created them all. And not only should they bow down, Every tongue 
should confess. And by the way, the word confess means to agree with. In the same sense, we should agree with God the Father that Jesus Christ is in fact co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with God the Father, and He deserves the name Lord. And that would be to the glory of God the Father. My, my, my. So, I was, I don't know what store I was in. I remember now, I was talking to the young clerk. I think it was Walmart. It's either there. I, I spend more time there in Cracker Barrel than most other places or Steak and Shake or something. But I was talking to one of the attendants wherever they were, and I, I was saying, I know this is not politically correct, but I want to know if you know a man named Jesus. I thought that fellow was going to have a revival in, the, in there. He said, ah, oh, my word. Thank God somebody still talks about Jesus. I said, don't get fired over it. <laughs> but he was, he was hyped up. And I thought, my God. He said, look, that makes, that so blesses my heart. I was sitting in Osceola, Georgia, in a, in, a, in a banker's office, and we were talking. And, and when we finished talking, I, I asked the, the banker, the young banker there, I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And he said, a matter of fact, I do. But I want to tell you something. In all the years that I've been a bank officer in this, in this bank, I have dealt with deacons, elders, pastors, preachers. I've never had anybody to ask me that question. I want to tell you, folks, how can we not mention that name? There's not salvation under any other. I mean, Christians can disagree on a lot of things, but we can't disagree on that. We have got to be able to comprehend and understand that His name ought to be on the tip of our tongue consistently. Consistently. Why? He deserves it all. And it's all about Him. Would you not agree? I know you all said that a whole lot less than you meant it. So I'll take it verbally as an echo from heaven. How's that? <laughs> that you know He is Lord.